So thanks to everyone for being here for this month's uh, edition of the Nevada County Coalition of Firewise Communities. Um, my name is Scott Beasley, chair of the, the coalition, and we appreciate you all taking time out of your busy schedules and uh, staying inside, uh, being on Zoom when it is so beautiful outside right now. Um, we've got a really great meeting lined up for you uh, today. We have got um, a focus on home hardening. So after this opening and some reminders, um, we will uh, be handing it off to Susan for your uh, resource of the month from the Insurance uh, Institute for Business and Home Safety, talking about their document, how to protect your property from wildfire. We'll then roll into our partner reports with uh, many of the usual suspects um, before getting into the bulk of the meeting, which is, again, our education topic of home hardening. So we have Roger Tucker with us. He is the lead defensible space coordinator for OES, talking about home hardening, uh, and he'll be the, the main presenter tonight, followed by Chief Mathias uh, from Cal Fire, addressing some best practices and perhaps some myths uh, about using pools, tanks, and roof sprinklers uh, as um, fire prevention for your home and neighborhood. Then we've got an actual case study. We know how much you uh, love to hear from your neighbors. So we have uh, Lauren Drutz from the 6B and Friends Firewise community talking about her experience and working with uh, some of the experts as well as the county uh, um, adding some water storage uh, out at her place. And then um, if there's time, I will get into um, the impact on insurance and, and specifically um, home hardening and some updates we have from the uh, California Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara's office. They actually responded to my email request for information first time in a while, so, so that's pretty exciting. Um, so um, with that, um, pressing on into our agenda here um, for our quick reminders, um, please sign up for Code Red. We've got some new faces here tonight. Um, welcome. If you haven't, please sign up for Code Red. And maybe a better reminder, um, as time has gone on, please update Code Red. If you have moved your home, moved your office, wherever you spend your time and had originally signed up for Code Red, please update that. Um, fire season is here, and uh, assuming Chief Mathias doesn't uh, uh, surprise us all with uh, news of the upcoming monsoon and prolongment or pushing back fire season, um, it's time that we all remind ourselves what our zone is. Then find your five emergency allies. Uh, if these are people you haven't checked in with all winter, time to reconnect with them. And then scout your route. We still got some snow up there. Um, those of you on the, the east side of the summit, uh, even up there in the Highway 20 corridor as you start to get east of um, uh, kind of White Cloud in that area, Conservation Camp, there, there is still some snow up there. But it's getting to be that time, and we'll dig more into this topic next month as we focus on evacuation, preparing, and routes. And then, as always, uh, we ask that you kindly bookmark the Ready Nevada County dashboard. And with that, let's get off and running. Susan, uh, floor is yours. Okie doke. Our resource of the month is on our education resources page here on the website of you know, Nevada County Coalition of Firewise Communities. I hope most of you know where that is. NC, coalitionfwc.com. Under educational resources and under best of the best, we have this information from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And what this is, is highly researched scientific information about what works to keep uh, buildings safe. And the insurance companies fund this outfit and these scientists because insurance companies are interested in reducing their losses. So they want to find out what are the building materials and the things you ought to do around a home or around a business that will reduce the chance of it burning down. So you can really trust their information. There's an 11 page assessment and checklist here. If you really want to do a deep dive, you've got the, the 40 page protecting your firewise community and all kinds of stuff there. I mean, here's the firewood, plants, siding, fences, gutters, roof covering, et cetera, and so on. And you can just download that to your computer. Or if you don't want all 40 pages, 
they have split up that 40 page guide into individual research fact sheets. And that's on the website of the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, which is the group that certifies all firewise communities. So you can go to that link and get just individual sheets on attic and crawl space, coatings, decks. And if you're thinking about getting a coating, be sure to read this one about coatings, fencing, fire spread, sprinkler systems, et cetera, and so on. So that's, this is all really good stuff. You can rely on it. It, uh, it is based on the science and, and these guys who set buildings on fire inside of giant warehouses to see what kind of siding resist fire, what kind of roofs, et cetera, coatings, and so on. You can trust it. Over and out. Back to you, Scott. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Susan. Um, let's jump right into our partner reports. Um, kicking it off, Chief Mathias, got a dad joke for us? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd hate to leave you hanging, right? But, uh, so uh, I'm wondering why comedians don't do that well when they go to Hawaii. Anybody know the answer to that? Because the only response they get is aloha. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Thank, so, thank oh, you. There you okay. go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this All is right, a real Jim Mathias. You may see two Jim Mathiases. Jamie had to jump on as me. I think she got the invite for me. So there's two of us here, but this may be the correct one. We have a little bit different voice. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as far as partner reports, what's going on with us, I'm just going to let you know where we're at. I, I think that everybody knows we're, we're in a drought. The, they did the snow survey and it came back dismal at best. Uh, so that basically means that the normal water storage that we have, which is our lakes in the snowpack, are non-existent this year. So that means that our fuels are going to be drier, our lakes are going to be lower, our rivers and streams are lower, and all that does is increase the fire danger. We've had a ton of fires locally, we have some statistics to, to back up that. So in the Nevada Eva Placer unit, uh, comparing 2021 to 2022, we are uh, at this time of year, so as of April 3rd of uh, this year compared to last year, more vegetation fires than we had this time last year, and we're up 15 acres, which is pretty substantial because our total acreage is only 37. 15 from last year, which was at 22 at this time. So that just tells us that, the, and that's the whole Nevada Human Plaster Unit, that's not just Nevada County, but I would say 85% of that is in Nevada County. Uh, Plaster County hasn't had a whole lot of fires, and Yuba County hasn't had many. Right here in Nevada County is where some of the driest brush is, and we just had a lot of fires this year so far. So what we're doing to combat that as far as Cal Fire is that you know, we've always had year round, we staff our engine out of station 20. We always have a dozer that's available. And station 20 is Nevada City. I'll try not to use fire department jargon. So uh, we have, our engine and then starting next week, we're gonna back firefighters so that we can staff some more engines. So on April 11th, um, they're going to start their training, which is about five days. So Friday at five, six o'clock, whenever they get the engines cleaned up and back in service after uh, a week's worth of pretty arduous training, they'll be staffing up the engines on the afternoon of the 15th. So what stations we're going to have staffed as far as Cal Fire goes in the unit, we'll still have the dozer out of Nevada City. Um, we'll have our National Guard hand crew We'll have our uh, Washington Ridge crew and two Placer Center crews down uh, in Christian Valley. And then our engines will be out in Nevada City. Um, normally our first engine that we staff is down in Smartville, but because we haven't had a lot of fire and we still are in a bit of a green up down in the, in the grass country in Smartville, we're gonna staff our North San Juan station or Columbia Hill station in the North San Juan area. And then of course Higgins, which is always staffed year round that's that's going to go normally it has two firefighters on it this time of year we're going to move that up to a third firefighter 
so we're a little bit more prepared for that. Um, all of the southern region has really had a run on, on wildland fires, so they're staffing up even earlier. So southern region is basically roughly from Stockton down south, uh, so below Amador County, and all of the air tanker bases in southern in our southern region are staffed up as of right now. So they had to prioritize all of those air tankers in through maintenance in the winter. And so what that did is that pushed ours kind of back a little ways. Uh, we will certainly be on contract by June 15th to have our two tankers out of Grass Valley and our air attack out of there as well. Um, and for the, the time being right now, we have two tankers out of McClellan, which isn't too terribly far away. I think that we can live with that and one air tanker out of McClellan. So McClellan will stay staffed until we can get everything through its maintenance cycle. And then we'll be up and running uh, in, uh, in our area in Grass Valley by June 15th, the latest. But we'll get that up and running as soon as we can. May 23rd is the date that the Grass Valley Air Attack Base will be 24 seven staffed and able to reload tankers out of there. They just won't station any tankers there. We will have pilots uh, doing training on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday uh, throughout the, until we get fully staffed up. So you will hear some tankers in and out of there, but, and we'll use them if we need them, but they're seven staffed or, or seven day week staffed until the June 15th deadline, unless we can get something up in a little bit sooner than that. So. Uh, in addition to that, we're kind of, we're not exactly sure where the, the state budget, the May revise of the governor's budget is coming up pretty quickly here, and uh, we'll have to see what that does to the CAL FIRE budget. As of right now, it, it's looking for some augmentation. We have two additional firefighters that the, the, the governor's already committed to adding to our unit here, Nevada Evil Placer unit. So every unit got you know, 20 to 25 firefighters more than they had last year. So that's pretty good, because even though the budget isn't signed yet. And so uh, a lot of changes with that when that gets figured out. But that's pretty much it for me, other than, oh, we do have some exclusive use helicopters that we're getting a type one. Uh, we're gonna probably put in the trucky area and type one is fired up jargon for a great big helicopter. So like a Chinook or a Blackhawk, and then we'll have another type two helicopter out of our Auburn headquarters uh, right off of I-80 at Bowman Road. So neither one of those two helicopters will have hand crews with them, but they'll be, uh, they'll be uh, exclusive use helicopters available to us. So likely will not get sent out uh, of state like, our, our federal partners will send some of their helicopters out to fight other fires across the United States, wherever the greatest need is. These two helicopters, plus our unit, and there's an emergency to have taken but last year, they left right here. So that's it for me. Thanks, Chief. And we especially appreciate you uh, translating to really big helicopter. That was absolutely needed. Um, yeah, I know Patrick Mason is out tonight. Do we have anyone else from Consolidated here with the report? They're, they're doing a very large badge pitting tonight, so I doubt you're going to have anybody here. Okay, cool. Then, Paul, um, you on a t-ball field, or do we get you back? Hey, Scott. Yep, I'm back reporting from uh, the Nevada Union parking lot. My kids are at wrestling practice tonight, so I appreciate everybody's latitude. Uh, I do have a, a geography observation for you or Chief Mathias that I'm not sure if you've ever noticed that Ireland is only one C away from Iceland. Something to keep in mind. Um, <laughs> uh, very happy to be on tonight. I'm Paul Cummings from uh, Nevada County Office of Emergency Services. I, I do have a few of my staff members on um, tonight as well. We've got Lieutenant Sean Scales with the Nevada County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Roger Tucker, our lead defensible space inspector, who Scott introduced earlier, he'll be speaking in a few minutes, and uh, Barbara Teagues and Ed Harvey on as well. So if you have questions for us, we'll remain on afterwards. Um, I'll just dive in. Uh, we do have a few grant updates, but I'm going to leave those to Jamie Jones because uh, these are all grants that we're partnering with them and Cal Fire on. I wanted to uh, remind the public, if you haven't heard, May 7th is the um, Children's Safety Carnival at the Rood Center. It's a great opportunity to bring your kids and grandkids and, and cousins and nieces and nephews out 
to see what law enforcement and our local community is doing, get information around some of the efforts um, of the Fire Safe Council, OES, public health, other things like that. You can have all kinds of cool equipment to see. So that'll be May 7th out at the Rood Center. I know that there's also a lot of um, Firewise communities doing things that day because that is the, um, that's, a, that's the National uh, Fire Preparedness Day. So uh, some of you may not be able to make it. So just wanna throw that out there. I wanted to announce that uh, Truckee is transitioning to Code Red. So Truckee, we've had two systems in our community. I know Scott and the coalition is always great about making sure folks sign up for Code Red. Um, the town of Truckee has been on Nixel. And so this summer, they're gonna make the switch to Code Red, which is great. Everybody on one platform, and that'll make messaging that much more seamless. So if you are a Truckee resident or you know anybody that's out in Truckee, um, prepare for that switch. More to follow. Uh, the green waste events are ongoing. Um, our building department has taken the lead on that this year. Those have been going really well, thanks to the Fire Safe Council for being such an outstanding partner on that. Um, they've been wildly popular. Uh, and thanks to all the volunteers who've, who've made that happen. We do have one last weekend, uh, April 8th, 9th, and 10th, this coming weekend, where um, uh, they'll be accepting your, your, your green waste at, for no cost out there at the Brunswick site. So if you have questions around that, please put those in the chat. Uh, we're still working on refining the Ready, Seco handbook. So you should be seeing those hit mailboxes hopefully in, in May or early June. Uh, more to follow there. News update, we've got three call boxes now installed uh, out at the river crossings. So that adds to the, the, the crossing that was already there. So we've now got Purden Crossing, uh, Edwards Highway 49, and um, Maybert Road out in the town of Washington. So that's four solar powered satellite call boxes down on the Yuba River. So that's gonna enhance river safety, um, fire safety, and just communications in an area that we all know can be very challenging. Uh, that call box has already been used, in fact, to, um, for, for a rescue that Nevada County Consolidated uh, did uh, last week for an injured hiker. Took 15 minutes off the response time, so that's big news uh, in the new area. County's working to hire a full-time county coordinator, so more to follow. This is um, from a state fire safe council grant that the county um, was awarded with, and um, you know, county leadership has decided they want to make this a full-time position. So this person is gonna help bring people together around wildfire prevention and mitigation projects and hopefully bring together some of the different stakeholders that we have in our community. So once we hire that person, we'll be introducing them on this forum and um, working with partners like Fire Safe Council, the fire agencies, Coalition of Firewise Communities, um, Firewise Communities themselves to figure out, you know, what is it you need? What are some of the gaps? How can we better collaborate around wildfire mitigation in our community? Uh, county is also interviewing this week, in fact, uh, for a full-time defensible space inspector. So we have uh, Mr. Roger Tucker, who's our lead, and normally we've had temps working for him that are seasonal. So again, as we're, the county's leaning into uh, the, these mitigation programs, you know, with our, our hazardous, um, uh, defensible space, uh, hazardous vegetation ordinance, we're bringing on a full-time inspector to just help throughout the year with educating residents around what they can do to make their homes uh, safe. And then lastly, um, uh, I've been asked to just encourage folks to, to get out there and take that broadband survey. I'll put a link in the chat after this, but this is really gonna help the county figure out what are the broadband issues of the residents in our community. The, the telecommunications providers have a perspective of where uh, the footprint is of their service. And a lot of us in the community are, have said, and a lot of you have said, you know, yeah, they don't serve my neighborhood or, you know, they may serve my neighborhood, but it's really slow on my street. And so this ties back into um, wildfire preparedness because, you know, messaging and, and information flow during these events is critical. Some of you only have one way to get informed and that's an AT&T landline that doesn't always work. Uh, so please get out there and take that survey. It'll help our leadership advocate for better telecommunication services in our community. And I'll drop that link in the chat. Stop there, Scott, and I'll be on the rest of the meeting if folks have questions. Thanks, Paul. That is a really quick survey. I took it for both home and business. It says five minutes, but it, it really takes two, unless, of course, you have internet like I do, and it took about 15, but, you know, uh, fill that out if you can. 
um, so that they can get that feedback about what you use uh, uh, broad or what you use internet for. It, a question does include, do you use it for uh, emergency updates or, or something to that effect? All right, um, Nevada County Fire Safe Council, Jamie, um, are you with us? Good evening, everyone. Jamie Jones, uh, also known as Jim Mathias tonight. Um, so I have a couple of updates. We are starting our access and functional needs grant program in partnership with the County of Nevada. So there's about 100 recipients that we'll be doing outreach to um, and communicating with them on when they'll be starting their project. The good news is there's still about 700 more homes that we are going to qualify. So if you know of any folks that um, might be able to utilize this program and qualify for this program, please send them our way, um, neighbors, family, et cetera. We're happy to work with them and get them through the application process. Uh, we will be starting the South County Fill Break Project um, here in the next few months. Our contract should be going before the Board of Supervisors um, in partnership with the county as well. Um, as Paul mentioned, the Green Waste Drop event, uh, this is the last weekend, um, as we know, um, and to, the, to date, uh, so 8th, 9th, and 10th, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, we do anticipate this to be the largest weekend, so please have some patience. Um, to date, it's run pretty smooth, but, um, you know, everybody wants to utilize this event, and since it's free, uh, we do anticipate a lot of traffic this weekend. Um, on that note, ESPOA is having their annual green waste event. So if you're an ESPOA resident um, or participant, participant, their green waste uh, was today and then Wednesday and Thursday. Um, the address sign program, the free address sign program that we partnered with, with from Cal Fire, just wanna give everybody an update to that. The, uh, the, the supplies have been ordered um, once we receive them we will uh, start making those signs and letting everybody know uh, we will work through that list um, on a first come first serve so if you signed up first you'll get your sign first i think want to thank everyone for their patience with that we know that we've had some supply chain issues on getting those signs so um my staff is currently working on a deer creek shaded shield break grant application through uh, hazard mitigation grant program funding in partnership with cal oes um, and fema so uh, in addition to that, we're also working on a, a home retrofit program. So we will be submitting two applications for those programs. Um, and we're told that they, they seem to be um, very successful programs. Uh, so we're, we look forward to getting news on those. The Defensible Space Advisory Training will be May 12th and 13th. I know that we have several people on that list. Uh, we do anticipate that we may have to have a second training so that we can keep the size down. Um, um, if you are interested, please uh, email us at info at rufiresafe.com. I'll put that here in the chat um, and, and make sure you're on that list. You can verify you're on the list or get on that list and we can add you for a second training date. Uh, and then we will have the wildfire season guide going out and um, hopefully to print before the uh, May 7th Community Wildfire Preparedness Day. So watch for that. Um, and I think that's about all I have. Actually, I do have one other, one other item. Our beloved Pat Leach um, is recovering from, from a fall. And so I think that she will likely be uh, Zoom only for a while, um, but she is very responsive still to emails and phone calls and, and messages. So um, it's gonna be her preferred format for uh, reaching out to folks in the absence of in-person meetings. But, um, we wish her well, and we hope that uh, everyone can still reach her. She's been really great so far, way better than I'd be doing after having surgery. So um, please uh, let me know if you need anything in addition to that, and I'm always happy to help. And I think that wraps up my report. Thanks, Jamie, and be sure to give our regards to, to Pat. We hope she's, she's healing quick here. Um, one more quick partner report, and then we'll get into the education topic from the Nevada County Transportation Commission. We heard a few months ago about a uh, study that was going on. Uh, we requested a lot of your feedback, and a lot of you gave it. We appreciate that, and I believe we have Mike Woodman uh, with us tonight um, with an update on that initiative. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate the opportunity to update the group. 
Um, we're very nearing um, completion of the draft report. Uh, we anticipate the draft report being available on the project website for review April 13th. Um, and then following that, we do have a public workshop scheduled for April 20th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, for those of you that maybe don't remember, um, the planning project that we're talking about is the Ready Nevada County Extreme Climate Event Mobility and Adaptation Plan, and really looks at you know identifying ways to improve the transportation infrastructure and mobility readiness for extreme climate events. Um, you know everything from extreme temperature to precipitation, snowpack, landslides, and you know uh, near and dear to this group uh, concerns related to wildfires and evacuation. Um, so really would appreciate it if you guys could review that draft plan, uh, participate in the public workshop. We'd love to hear your input and feedback on some of the draft uh, strategies uh, that are in that plan. Um, I will drop a link to the flyer in the chat and then also follow up with Scott uh, later to push out some information uh, prior to that workshop. So. Uh, that's all I have for tonight, but really looking forward to uh, uh, daylighting that draft plan and getting some input and feedback. What was the date of the workshop again, please, Mike? April 20th uh, from 5.30 to 7, and it'll be a virtual Zoom workshop. Oh, and Susan. Yes, thank you. I uh, just want to thank you for uh, your efforts to coordinate a while back with Caltrans to uh, thin out the uh, trees adjacent to the banner overcrossing. Uh, with the recent uh, fire we had, uh, that could have been uh, a little bit worse if uh, that thinning hadn't been done. So thank you for those efforts. You're welcome, thank you. And, and PG&E had a lot to do with that too. So it was kind of a joint thing. All right, thanks Mike for, for sharing. Um, I know I've got that meeting on, on my calendar and I look forward to the, the, the draft release. I dropped a link in the chat. Please confirm that is uh, the right one uh, that you wanted to be pushed out there. All right, and we are moving on to our monthly education topic of home hardening. Uh, again, here with us tonight uh, is the lead defensible space coordinator for Nevada County OES, that's Office of Emergency Services. Um, Roger Tucker here to share some uh, best practices for home hardening. Uh, Roger, floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Roger Tucker. I'm the lead defensible space inspector for the Nevada County Office of Emergency Services. I've been here about a year and a half, and I come from a background of doing risk management for a large agricultural insurance carrier. Um, Spent most of my time in California doing risk assessments, and a big part of that was defensible space inspections. We really focused on adhering to PRC 4291, which dealt with 100-foot defensible space. So that, that's my background, and hopefully tonight maybe I can show you a different perspective because now we're enforcing, I'm enforcing the Nevada County Hazardous Vegetation Ordinance, which is slightly different, has some additional tools that we can use to make the community a little bit safer. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. How's that look, everyone? I don't see a shared screen myself. No, we just see your name. Now, yeah. Just your name. Any better? Not yet. You have multiple. Scott, is share screen enabled? He should be able to. Roger is a co-host. Oh, okay. He 
Here we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So this was actually created in uh, conjunction with Patrick Mason, Deputy Fire Marshal. So what is defensible space? This I'm sure isn't a surprise to a lot of people here tonight, but it's the, the buffer you create between structures on your property, grass, trees, and, and any other combustible materials or wildland, wildland areas that are surrounding structures. In the county, we're also looking and considering defensible space as how they apply to the primary ingress and egress, that's driveways and private roadways where property owners land borders the roadways and making sure those are safe for ingress, egress for emergency vehicles and homeowners in the event of an evacuation. And with our ordinance specifically, we're looking for a, a 10 foot lateral area off the driving surface of the road to a height of 15 feet. And that's not clear cutting that area. That's just reducing the hazardous vegetation. So we're not just solely looking at structures with our program. We're looking at three separate zones. Typically in my past dealing with 4291, we were looking at the zero to 30 feet and then 30 to 100 feet. Um, now with all the information available, with ember free zones and how that can impact ignition of a structure. Well, we haven't adopted this into our ordinance. Um, once California does, most likely that's gonna come down to us as well, but we are spending the time right now to have that discussion with property owners throughout the county. So they are aware that, you know, that information is out there. We know that that's a, a, an area where a lot of the structure ignition start. So um, it's a good idea to address that. And a lot of the feedback we get from property owners in the field is that, wow, that's really gonna change how my property looks as far as landscaping goes. And it, it's gonna be a big change, but I, I think, you know, once we educate the property owners, they, they understand the importance of that area. So I, hopefully that will take hold. Zone one is the no fuel zone or ember free zone around the structure. It's a good idea to use fire resistant materials for ground covers in this area, gravel, concrete, paver stones, and then maintain the roofs and gutters free of debris. Trim overhanging branches a minimum of 10 feet off the roof line. If people are gonna plant within this area, they should be small plantings and spaced away from windows, doors, vents, and all plants should be irrigated and the dead material should be removed. Another big one we've we've done, have seen a lot in the field is wood fences connected directly to, to the sides of homes. And we've really tried to get people to break that combustible fence line up and get it away from the house. And that can be achieved with a metal gate or just using non-combustible materials. And then storing firewood or other flammable materials away from the house with, within this area. And that, that goes for the next zone two that we're gonna look at next. So zone two, we're looking at that five to 30 foot area. And we're trying to break up continuous fuels, create islands or mosaics, where we're pulling out all the dead and dying material. We're removing ladder fuels and trying to achieve a three X separation between the fuels under trees and the lowest tree branches. Trying to keep all grasses and weeds to a maximum height of four inches or less within this area and everything should be irrigated within this area if possible. Consider removing and replacing varieties of plants that have high oil content, junipers, rosemary, oleanders are just some of the examples. We do see a lot of uh, junipers, especially along bordering driveways up against houses that was very popular. I don't know how long ago, maybe 10 years, um, but it's, I know there's a lot of communities that are, are looking to remove those and replant with something that's a little more fire safe. And then removing all combustible materials, and that's not just plants or hazardous vegetation, but structures. I um, see a lot of people that are trying to hide their propane tanks to just look them, make them look a little more visibly pleasing um, with wood. And that's, that's not a great idea. So we're looking to, to have some clearance around those. And those propane tanks can be within zone two or three, and that, that applies to both. So zone three extended the 30 to 100 feet. We're looking to, again, break up 
the vegetation into smaller groupings and then spacing the canopies of the trees at least 10 feet apart and that's that's a big job for a lot of property owners that are in locations that have a lot of trees around their house that that can uh, quickly add up as far as cost to to remove those and create that separation all the ladder fuel should be removed in this area remove again dead and dying materials and your firewood should be stacked at least 30 feet or more away from any of the structures and that again is a tough one and um, it's just having a clear area around that wood pile as well and then consider you know in nevada county there's a lot of changes in slope so considering that we always convey that the 100 foot defensible space is a starting point if you've got uh steeper slopes then you know you might need 150 feet and then more spacing between the trees so we we do have those discussions with people when they're applicable and you know our our ordinance here in nevada county allows the inspectors to enforce additional clearances so that makes our job easier more or less if if that was to apply Home hardening, um, you know, these are some of the topics we're going to look at, but really these are discussions we have with property owners in the community when they've achieved their defensible space. Because, um, you know, the defensible space in our mind is the, the most critical thing to start with. Once that's achieved, then we start looking at the home hardening. And just the, the nature of our work, that usually includes um, working with a lot of the reporting parties when we're dealing with complaints. Um, they're the people that typically will have already achieved a defensible space and they might be having uh, issues with the roadway vegetation or the adjacent properties, which is different than 4291. We can actually enforce on those adjacent properties if their hazardous vegetation is impacting um, the reporting parties. So that's the discussion we have it. Again, it's not part of the ordinance at this time maybe down the road it will be included but we have these discussions when somebody is looking to what what can i do now to improve my property i've achieved the 100 foot defensible space and i'm really looking to go above and beyond now so vents around the houses that's something we look at if we notice deficiencies we'll have discussions with folks um, windows types of siding on their structure the roof types voids and in, in building constructions roof sprinklers uh, we get asked a lot of questions about those and I, I know there's different opinions on those and this is probably getting into patrick mason's specialty and and he's the one that should uh really report on that fire retardant sprays for houses we'll have some information coming up here different references that people can can look at and com combustible materials immediately around the house and then use of non-combustible building materials for new construction and renovations vents these are usually pretty visible to us when we're doing inspections um, the kind of standard is a one one eighth inch screen mesh and now there are multiple types of self-sealing vents available and they're very very expensive um, and then baffled vents as well windows use of dual pane windows tempered glass and sealing all the gaps around those windows um, and we're also looking when we we look at the windows i you know majority of what we see are these type of, of windows out there but we're also looking to see what's planted around the windows and you know sometimes we can see curtains inside that's that's all things that we consider when we're completing an inspection siding a lot of people have moved to the cement fiber but there's still some t111 out there obviously different types of sidings are uh, less combustible than others. And there's, I think, a big move towards stucco um, and cement fiber. Roof coverings, asphalt shingles, class A fire rated, that's the, the big one. Metal, very expensive, but has the same class A fire rating as a composite. Wood shake, you don't see that much anymore. So the insurance companies are definitely going to have a problem with that and they're combustible with a lot of gaps in between all the shakes and shingles decks when we're completing inspections out in the field we're always looking at the decks that's definitely an area for trash and leaf litter to collect combustible materials 
if there are decks that have wood lattice or even the PVC lattice, you want to be able to easily access that area under because it's still going to need to be cleaned out on a regular basis. But we're always looking at that to make sure there's not an accumulation of, of combustible materials. It's also a popular space under decks for people to store things, wood, gas cans, all that good stuff. And then cleaning gutters and having covers on the gutters, that's a regular maintenance and needs to be done. Combustible materials found around the house that need to be accounted for. And last year I lived down in Smartsville and we were evacuated twice, advisory evacuations. And this is what took me the most time to, to get out was dealing with these items. We have a lot of patio furniture and getting those cushions off and moving the, the small propane tanks from the grill inside. And geez, it, it, was, it took a lot of time making sure the, the main gas was shut off to the house. So th this is good to not have a bunch of items around. So when it comes time that you have to evacuate, it's, it's much easier to take care of. Other considerations for you know, what can be done on the inside of the home, window coverings, just what you choose for window coverings can make a difference when heat transfers to the inside. These are combustible materials. And again, I'm sure any firefighter can speak better to this than me, but they, I'm sure they've seen these items, couches and chairs that are up against the windows. Um, they're combustible, dust with papers, lampshades, all that should be considered. And if there is a fire, if you're being evacuated, consider pulling those items away from the windows. Sprinkler systems. Um, there's a web link here that has some great um, considerations on if you're thinking about putting in exterior sprinkler, what you should consider. And do you have enough water? Do you have power? Um, you, th there's so many things to consider. Uh, when are you going to turn it on? How long can it provide water to, to cover the home or the, the structures of the area around to prevent embers from igniting a house? Is it going to impact the pressure for other, other fire suppression that's taking place in that community neighborhood? Um, and what the, the roof covering that's installed, will it provide a high level of fire protection? And then we just have a lot of other reference material here. Oh, let me go back to that. I would highly recommend looking at the various links we have here. I think um, applying different coverings for, let me just move this real quick, sorry about that. Hey, Roger. So, yes, sir. This is Nick Johnson. Uh, I, I don't mean to cover this because I actually spoke to the State Fire Marshal's office on this one. Oh, please, please do, yes. Okay. Great. So um, there was a, a, a lot of questions about fire retardant sprays. And um, Patrick asked me to do some research because he was quite busy. So I spent some time this weekend and yesterday, about probably about six hours. Um, and I had a great conversation with a project manager from the state fire marshal's office from Cal Fire that presented, went through this and presented a lot of information to me, which I thought was really, really good. So this first thing, exterior surfaces, um, California fire marshal at the far, state fire marshal's office, and I would think this is, they are part of Cal Fire that this would go down to pretty much all the fire marshals that um, California building codes basically do not allow or do not uh, justify the use of coatings for the structures, exterior structures. Um, and they don't, there's nothing to prove to do that. Now there's products out there that will do this, do different things though. So if you're thinking about it, you really need to really peel back the onion and look at some of these products. Because when I looked at a lot of these products, they 
either were one interior use only and they it wasn't very clear you actually had to go back into the literature application literature to understand that and then there there are some exterior things but they are primarily for untreated wood surfaces like uh, cedar shingles and wood siding and can only be applied to raw wood okay so if you're thinking about this what you want to look for on these products is really the class a fire protection because they do adhere to a standard around identifying if the product is class a or class b fire protection um, but again california state fire marshal basically none of this is approved before because of the california building codes and they're not looking at doing anything about researching these again because of the california bureau building codes okay um interior i spoke to the fire marshal and i think there's a link here about public tools and you might need to go one link farther that there is um, some certification or licensing by the state fire marshal. And at this URL, if you go down one layer, you can actually look at what they do. Again, you need to really peel back the onion and say, what is it I'm trying to do and this will this product work? Because some of these products are for fabrics because NFPA 701 is really about uh, fire protection for fabrics and fabrics like curtains, uh, tarps that are gonna be used for tents and temporary um, uh, tarp baked structures. But they do allow it for some interior applications to walls like gypsum and things that can help. So again, you really need to look at what am I trying to do and what products are out there. Now, when I spoke to the state uh, fire marshal office, um, the state, when it comes to vegetation production, really relies on the forest service. And that's because that most of the things are certified for or licensed or approved are really the same things that are being dumped by uh, helicopters and the air tankers. But if you go to this site, there is one, one couple products that uh, the project MPA and L LCN5, 95A that are available to consumers and there have been uh, approved and gone through the process, the federal process for ground application via sprayers. And there are products you can look at the internet that are based, that are these products that you can spray through a ground sprayer or an application sprayer backpack, okay? Backpack. Hey, Nick, so, I, I wonder, sorry. I wonder if, if this information you have, it seems very valuable, could be summarized on a page or two that we could put on the, the website for people. Certainly, it's, it's, I'd be happy to do that. I think this does it a little bit, but let me finish and I'd be happy to take it offline and do that. So these products, if you apply them, they will last until they're washed off. Now, the Forest Service doesn't test how long they will last, but they say it will last for months as long as they it doesn't rain. Now, if they're applied to green vegetation, they need to be, it needs to be reapplied when they dry. Now, and this is, this may answer some of the questions about, do I need to spray 20 minutes before a fire? And really it says, the, pro the product literature says, hey, if you apply this to raw wood, like fences and other things that may have raw wood siding, that it will protect it. However, uh, it leaves a white residue, so it may not look apparent. So what they suggest is, okay, you wash it off. Well, if you wash it off, there goes your, prior, your fire protection. So um, really, hopefully that summarizes some of the things about um, 
added uh, fire retardants for paint, fire retardant sprays, and even additives. There's several things out there, but you really need to look. What am I trying to do? Read the Roger literature. and Nick, we got a it's minute not. on the clock. Okay, I'm through. So, uh, Roger, back to you. Thank Remember, you, these, these products are part of the IBHS materials that I, that I mentioned at the, at the top of the meeting, uh, what the IBHS science and research is, feels about them too. So folks can look there also. Okay, and I'm, I'm pretty much done. The only thing I just want to clarify or, or emphasize is that defensible space around your home is a priority, trying to achieve those different zones. And then all the other measures are in addition to that, achieving a defensible space. So that's it. Thank you very much. Good stuff, Roger. Thanks for sharing. And he didn't get a proper intro. That was uh, your other speaker there was Nick Johnson, who is uh, vice chair of the, the coalition. Um, so we um, are moving on. We have got up next, we're going back to Chief Matthias um, to dig a little bit deeper on some of uh, those things that were actually just discussed, including roof sprinklers, tanks and such. And I know we had some questions in the chat that might be addressed here. So what do you got for us? Well, the, the first thing that I have for you, it's very important that Roger said, I hope everybody was listening to it, um, he said that he has a whole bunch of outside furniture, which means that he can have a really large barbecue at his house and invite us all over. So, uh, Roger, yeah, I guess I'm calling you out, buddy. Um, so there you go. Okay, so I was asked to talk. Is my screen sharing work, everybody? Are you are you seeing something that says what is your water supply? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, I, I'm glad that that is working, and I don't really. Let me get back to where I can move my screen around. Okay, so what's your, I, I added a few pictures so we could kind of see what we were talking about. So people are concerned, maybe fire sprinklers, uh, residential sprinklers on the outside of their home could stop a fire, should a wildland fire be burning through your neighborhood. So I think you have to evaluate what for the fire you're gonna deal with. Um, at, I almost find it comical, but usually tragic that somebody with their garden hose thinks that they're going to be more efficient with their five GPM nozzle that comes off of their garden hose. Uh, they're going to be more efficient than my three firefighters that have spent their entire career training to fight fires and, uh, and have 500 gallons of water with a thousand GPM pump. To, they, they think that they're going to be more effective at stopping the fire than uh, than those trained firefighters with the you know three hundred four hundred five thousand dollar piece of equipment and all the training they have. So we evaluate what we're trying to do with those sprinklers. So an oncoming flaming fr fire front, we don't even stand in front of that. So I really hope that you don't stand in front of that. And I don't think that anything that you could ever put around your home is going to stop that. But a lot of people think, gosh, maybe maybe the embers that we were talking about, you know, we have that, that zero zone, the zero to five feet around your home. And I think that that's where you really can evaluate that sprinklers are going to be valuable for your home. So you have to look at all these other little things, like how many gallons of water storage do you actually have available? So if you're hooked to a municipal, municipal supply, you may think it's a, an endless supply of water. You can just turn those sprinklers on and, and go away. So if you look at the, the top picture that has the multiple sprinklers all over the roof and all over the front of the house and the deck, uh, if you could really sit underneath it, if it wasn't so crowded, you'd see water running off of the deck. That's a lot of water wasted. We ran into that situation in the river fire in the city of Colfax. Uh, a lot of people had just their garden hoses and their sprinklers on in front of their homes. And that coupled with the fire damage to the homes depleted the water storage system in the, the city of Colfax. So we shut off the water storage system so we could get the hydrants to work. So we really discourage you if you're on municipal supply to just turn the sprinklers on and go away. And if you added some of these commercial sprinklers that can spray, each nozzle can spray anywhere between five GPM and 25 GPM per minute, uh, all over your home. So if you have if you have 10 25 gallon per minute, you're flowing 250 gallons per minute. 
And once again, we're encouraging you to evacuate early. So if you're flowing 250 gallons per minute and you leave two hours before the fire gets to your house, you're really being pretty inconsiderate of the firefighting effort and everybody around you. It just, it's really not an efficient way to apply water to your home. And if you have your own private system, does your own private system, if you leave early enough, can you charge those sprinklers and are you gonna have enough water storage capacity? Because remember, uh, sometimes we're in public safety power shutoffs. Sometimes your generator is running and you have a pump that'll work and sometimes the power shuts off and it just doesn't work out that you have enough water supply to supply those. Um, so you have to think about that. How much water do you have and how many gallons per minute does, does each sprinkler flow? So how long can you run your system after you turn it on and you evacuate is another thing. If you look at the picture in the right-hand bottom corner, that's a, a different kind of a system. One that you're supposed to actually throw up on top of your roof. I don't know how many people like to run around up on top of your roof when you're supposed to be getting your go bag and, and uh, getting in your car and driving away before the roads are all crowded with everybody trying to evacuate. And we certainly hope that you don't slip off the roof while you're setting up the system. So uh, I'm not saying that they're that they're completely useless, but I think that there's a better use of your time. I think the, the, the facts that Roger just gave you with home hardening are gonna be way more valuable than a system like that. Um, you also have to think if you have a system like that and you have uh, a normal residential supply and you're not hooked to a municipal supply, does your, your pump storage system have enough pressure to supply through all of that friction loss of all the hose that's all over the place. So some of those nozzles have to have a minimum of 40 PSI in order to function properly as advertised. So you can, you can pull up some YouTube videos of these things working and you see these sprinklers shooting 50, 100 feet. Well, they need at least 40 PSI. And I don't know how many of your homes have that kind of pressure built into them. So I guess if you can get the system up and running and you have enough water storage capacity, then there certainly is a possibility. But what we don't want to see is we don't want to see you delaying your evacuation to set up a system like this, possibly get injured, or we don't want you depleting the water system for a municipal water supply. So make all those calculations. And then the other picture that I have on there is just a, a kind of a, a picture of the, the conditions that we deal with. As that fire front comes through, you see all those embers in that one that says Getty Images on it. That's a firefighter dealing with a wildland fire. And I think we've probably all heard it before. Wildland fires create their own wind. And a, a pretty slow wind right at the fire front is 40 miles an hour. They can be much more than that. So the, the sprinklers that you're seeing with a 40 mile an hour per uh, wind are not gonna be very efficient against fire brands. So if you're on the outskirts of the fire and the fire brands aren't, you know, are your biggest worry because you haven't kept your roof clean and your gutters clear of leaves, then yeah, these things could be somewhat efficient, but you know, risk versus gain and, and cost versus effectiveness, you really have to evaluate that. Uh, I just haven't seen a lot of these systems be successful and I haven't seen every fire that there ever was, but I, I'm telling you, I haven't seen very many systems that were successful. Okay, so that's fire sprinklers in a nutshell. Moving right along to standards for new construction, basically water storage tanks is what we're talking about. And uh, I sent Susan this little flyer that's uh, put out by the, the Nevada County Community Development Department that shows some of the standards and some of the details. If you live in Nevada County Consolidated District, they have a lot better flyer that they can send you out with, with details more details, but this is kind of a down and dirty if you were gonna put a water storage tank around your home. So of course, water storage is good in, in every way that you do it. The biggest thing about it is a lot of people don't set it up right, and then even less people will maintain it. So you're not required to put one of these at your house unless you're remodeling your home or you're building a new home. So if, the, if you wanna retrofit it, this is one way to do it. You can have a tank, uh, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 30,000 gallons. Keep in mind anything over 5,000 gallons is going to have to require a permit, which is you're going to have to go through all these check boxes on this form. Uh, you know, you're going to have to have a foundation for it and, and all these different rules and regulations. 
the biggest thing about it is, is it maintained and can the fire engine get to it? Is it somewhere in a big turnaround? And remember our fire engines take a little bit more room to turn around than, than your Prius does. Uh, and usually what's gonna be coming to fill up out of these water tanks, if there's one available, is gonna be a water tender and they take even more room to turn around. So if, if it's not well-maintained and it's not easy to access, and I don't know about you, but every time that I've ever really kind of had a big turnaround in a rural area, it seems like a very convenient place for somebody to put that car that just isn't quite running, or maybe their wood pile because they wanted to move it more than 30 feet away from the home, uh, or they have their boat stashed there, or it's a convenient place to, to put uh, anything else in that big turnaround area. So really think about that. So the tank itself, when you have uh, the port that sticks into it on the bottom right side of the picture there, you see the big water tank where the port's coming out of it. It, it has to be, that should be four inches, not uh, four feet minimum port, up to six inches up from the bottom of the tank. Can't be any more than six inches and you don't want it right on the bottom of the tank because if any mud or, or sludge or anything like that ever goes into the tank, then that's what we're siphoning out rather than good clear water. So four inches to six inches from the bottom of the tank. Minimum of four inch schedule 40 PVC, be bigger, it could be schedule 80, uh, 12 inches underground to wherever the fire department connection is or the riser that the fire engine or the water tender would hook to, uh, or it could be mounted directly on the tank. Keep in mind that it has to be in a big wide turnaround area. If you want this to be as effective as possible, I'm saying a lot of you should, you have to, that kind of stuff. Honestly, if you're not building a new home or, uh, or rebuilding yours, doing some major modifications, you aren't required to do this. But if you want to do it, to have more water storage, these are the things that you should do. Uh, so that fire department connection should be 18 to 24 inches above the ground on an approved concrete pad, uh, 4 to 12 feet from the turnaround so that our hoses, so we carry hard suction. So if there's an enough gravitational force or what we call head pressure pushing the water out of the tank, we have to hook a suction hose to it. And most engines carry 10 to 12 feet of hard suction hose. So that's why we say a minimum of four feet and a maximum of 12 feet from the approved turnaround so that whatever vehicle we're coming to get that water has that hard suction hose that they can use it. Um, the fire department valve needs to be a, a four inch coming out of the, the tank and that's, inner, uh, that's iron pipe thread and that's hooked onto a reducer that takes it to a four and a half inch so if we have a large suction hose, we, most of our fire engines have a four and a half inch national hose uh, coupling on it. And then also a two and a half because some fire engines don't have four and a half inch couplings. They only have two and a half inch couplings. So water storage is good, but it's really important that we have access and that it's well maintained. And you have to understand that we aren't always gonna access those things because the vast majority of the ones that we take the time to hook up to are not maintained or they have just really sludgy, junky, rock-filled water and one fire engine sucks one of those rocks in and that fire engine is, is not able to, it's mechanically deficient from that point on. So a little bit of a problem there with water tanks. They're a great advantage if they're maintained and easily accessible, but sometimes they're, they're an attractive nuisance for us We'll pull up and spend time hooking up to it and find out there's no water in it or the water is too dirty to use. So uh, last thing that I was asked to discuss is swimming pools and water. So a bunch of cool pictures there of, of what swimming pools, what we do with swimming pools. It is a good water storage system. It has the same problems as the water tank. We have to be able to access it. So what we'll typically do with a swimming pool is we have little Honda pumps that flow oh, about 100, 150 GPM that have, a, they're a portable top pump that we keep in the back of our fire engine. We can pick them up, set them by the swimming pool and use that to fill our water tender or our engines. And we just run a hose from there. It just takes a long time to fill up a water tender, those, those little one, in, one and a half inch hoses. 
and the smaller pumps. So yes, there's, there are good water storage. And some people think, oh gosh, if in a wildfire scenario, I would just hop in the swimming pool and I'd be safe. That is, that is certainly not the circumstance. We want you to get out. Uh, I guess if all else fails, you can go into your swimming pool with the fire burning over the top of you. But the chances are that a tree is going to fall on top of you, or more importantly, that uh, that we would get some hot gases and carbon monoxide that would overtake you. I had a, a local person, I was doing a discussion, a meeting similar to this, and she was able to show me some of her family members were in a wildfire and they had a pretty nice home in a large swimming pool and they ran and hid it in the pool and they didn't hear from them for a few days uh, because of the area was just, it was burned over and there was a lot of damage. Come to find out that both family members were in the pool uh, and in critical condition. And I'm, I'm not certain of the word back about whether they survived, but at the time, they had spent at least a month in the hospital, overcome with carbon monoxide and hot gases, and it, it didn't sound like they were going to make it. So uh, that's that's a tragedy, and it doesn't happen to every single person, but swimming pools are, are a great wash storage device if we can get to them. But uh, as you can see by the middle center picture there, that's kind of a, I got that out of uh, Europe. That's a, a, an English fire engine hook up to a, a little swimming pool there. It takes a few more people and it renders that fire engine non-mobile anymore. And we want them to be able to be mobile so we can run from one house to the other. The cool at the top right corner, our helicopters will use uh, ponds, lakes, rivers, and large swimming pools. And they're able to dip out of that and use that as a water resource. And the bottom right picture, I just threw that in there because I thought it was uh, just kind of neat to see that even uh, swimming pools uh, can burn. So they're flammable material. If the fire's hot enough, they can catch fire as well, especially with some of the trinkets that we put around outside of swimming pools that'll catch on fire and transfer that heat over to the swimming pool. Anyway, that's, uh, uh, I didn't get much uh, time to cover all that. There's, I mean, I could talk for hours on that, but I think everybody else has something else to do. And I'm happy to answer any questions about any of that stuff. But that's a, a very brief rundown on those three resources. Thanks so much, Chief. We, we appreciate you taking the time and, and digging into those uh, and just on some of those myths around uh, pools as, as uh, safety features. Um, with our next presenter, so we, we had the, the two experts talk about a lot of different specs and such things. Um, now you get to hear from your neighbor. Uh, Lauren uh, Drutz is from the Six B and Friends Fire uh, Wise community, and she uh, put in some water storage um, for herself and her neighborhood. So Lauren, um, tell us a little bit about your experience. Hi. Yeah, I'm fairly obsessive compulsive about fire preparedness. Um, um, are you hearing me? Yep, you're good. Okay. Yes. So um, in the spring of 2020, I convinced my husband, Jim, that we should install 5,000 gallons of fire protection water on our property. Um, I'm, yeah. So to make sure that we created a water system that is compatible and accessible by the fire department, we studied the specifications document from our local Nevada County Consolidated Fire District. Um, and just so you know, this document is also available on the coalition website under my fire department. Um, we followed all their specs and uh, submitted our site plan and simple plumbing diagram to Nevada County, Nevada County Consolidated for review. Um, to verify that our plans complied because ultimately the purpose of our water storage is for the use by firefighting crews. Um, next photo. Uh, the next step was to dig the hole in preparation for delivery of two 2,500 gallon water tanks that I ordered. Our contractor excavated and prepped the site eventually creating a hole six feet deep, 16 feet on each side with a four inch bed of sand at the bottom, all tamped down and le laser leveled. Next slide, please. A few days later, our concrete tanks from Georgetown Precast arrived. 
And these containers are often used for septic systems, but they also work great for water storage. Next slide, please. Each tank was carefully placed into the hole by a Georgetown precast driver. Each tank is about six feet wide by 13 feet long by six feet tall. Next slide, please. Um, then after my husband installed the PVC galvanized pipes and dry hydrant, we added and compacted soil around the tanks, filled the tanks with our NID irrigation water and added the blue sign. Breakdown of the costs, as you can see, um, it's 4,400 for two concrete tanks, including delivery, 1,400 for plumbing supplies and other hardware, $4,000 for uh, excavation and site prep, no permit fees. The total cost of a storage was $9,800 with my husband doing all the plumbing work and miscellaneous labor. And then by comparison, the bid we got from a local water systems company to do the same project was $13,300. And that was for 500 fewer gallons of water. Our insurance currently does not offer a discount for having water storage for fire protection. Um, another insurance company might. Each insurance company has its own set of discounts and the types of discounts can change. So it's really important to ask. If you consider installing a water system for fire protection, the staff of Nevada County Consolidated was very helpful and knowledgeable. But if you're in a different fire district, contact your local fire district and they definitely will help you. Uh, 5,000 gallons of fire protection water storage costs a lot of money and it took a lot of time and work, but we're glad to did it. we did it. The system will be around long after we're gone and we feel it was worth it to add another layer of fire preparedness to our property and our community. That's all. Thanks, Lauren. We, uh, we appreciate you sharing that story in the process. Um, I think I might have missed it in there, but what was the timeline? So like, how long did it take to go, you know, from getting a design to actually uh, putting the blue sign up? I guess, um... We started thinking about it in uh, like December the year before and um, planning. I think it was also um, based on when our contractor could dig it for us. So it, it ended up, we put it in in June. So, you know, six months, but that was a lot of thinking and talking and designing and, and Terry McMahon helped us a lot. He came out and saw where we were gonna, actually I asked him where would be the best place so we did a lot of planning. It didn't take that long once we got going. <laughs> got it. Uh, thank you. Well, we, we again, we always appreciate to hear from, from our friends and neighbors from around the county and hearing what it actually takes to make some of these, uh, take some of these ideas from concept to, uh, in, through production. So I don't know if you saw it. You're getting some kudos in the chat, and I saw a couple of thumbs up uh, from the audience. So again, thanks oh, for, thanks. for your time. Um, Lorena had also referenced that her insurance company does not credit uh, for the water tank. It was just something that made her feel a little bit uh, safer adding that layer of protection. Um, next topic is I was going to go through a presentation on some things going on at the um, California Insurance Commissioner's Office. We have run a bit long, and I want to make sure we get to your question. So I'm going to cut myself from the agenda. I mean, if we're being honest, none of you wanted to hear me talk much longer anyways. Um, but your 30-second your, your summary is that the insurance department is working on just that in requiring insurers to uh, acknowledge the work that's being done at an individual home level and through organized um, uh, organized groups where they basically name you know uh, firewise communities that are certified and up to uh, up to date with firewise USA so maybe at another meeting I'll be able to get into the details um, as we go through questions, I'm going to drop a, a link in, in the chat for those of you who are a little bit curious. You can go and read these developments. They're all based on press releases uh, from the commissioner's office. So, but again, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut that from the agenda um, and move on to our, our open community forum with some questions. Now, I know we've already had a lot in the chat, 
Um, Susan, did you want to, did you have a couple queued up ready to rock right now? Sure. Yes, thanks. Maureen is, uh, has asked, she got her CalFare plan renewal and her premium doubled from last year. It's now over $6,000. CalFare told her that the reason it was doubled was because uh, they doubled the Banner Mountain risk rating from a four to an eight. So they doubled area premiums. And her question is, which state entity is responsible for this rating, the risk rating, and is the entity aware of the financial impact of their changes on the citizenry? So do we know, uh, Jim, Jim Mathias, do you know who is required, who is responsible for the rating map? Is that, that's a CAL FIRE map, is it? Well, if we're talking about fire hazard severity zone map, that, that's CAL FIRE's, and I don't, I didn't know that the new one was made public yet or published. I knew that we were going to change the wind ratings for it. So there's a lot of microclimates and, uh, and that will increase some of the fire hazard severity zones. I don't believe the new one is published yet. So it's probably an, an ISO insurance office uh, rating that, that they're discussing there because our, I don't think our fire hazard severity zones have changed in the last couple of years. I know that we were changing them and adding some wind factors into them that were not gonna be favorable for this area, but I don't think that's out yet. So I'm not really sure what rating we're talking about. Yeah, I think it, I think you hit it, Jim. It's the latter. The It's not the severity zones because those are much broader in nature. At least they were until this update that's about to be released anyways. Um, the insurance zones are a little more specific where you know, Manion Canyon can be different than the Brunswick Basin, which can be different than um, the, you know, Banner Mountain, as, as we discussed. So, yeah, those are more in insurance industry specific, and they're, they're based on risk factors. So to answer the latter question of do they know the impact on the citizenry, they, they, they do. Um, and unfortunately, it's based on uh, how much money they're losing in similar areas around the country based on a formula that includes things like distance to um, uh, distance to fire hydrant, distance to um, fire station, um, the topography, um, population density, things like that. So um, it's just the unfortunate nature that um, companies have been losing money year after year after year after year after year. And how insurance is paid for, insurance claims are paid for, are by other people who are insured. So we're, we're all really just pooling our money together and that pool has not paid for the losses. So uh, there's no, unfortunately, no good answer to this one. Okay. Uh, Sandra is asking, uh, is there any chance of another green waste uh, disposal event after the May 7th wildfire preparedness day, which is not a green waste event. So I, I believe what Sandra would, means is uh, another event after the, the storm disposal event is the third one of those is this weekend. And uh, Paul, do you have, uh, there's typically the, the normal free green race disposal is in the, in the fall or later in the summer, isn't it? Because this one yeah. we're having now is a special event for the storm. It, it is, but um, right now we just don't have any other funding lined up to do any more events. Um, Truckee has some events that are coming, but those are in Truckee for, for Truckee residents. So I would encourage residents to still use the existing options they have. If it's safe to burn on a, on a good air quality day before burning closes, you can burn, take things to the transfer station, you know, get together with your neighbors and rent a, a chipper or, a, or, or go in on a green waste dumpster. But we don't have any more um, green waste events planned after this weekend. Jamie Jones may know about like she's already mentioned for the Alta Sierra, you know, some, some local options, but there's no county sponsoring coming forward. Thank you. Myron is asking, uh, he's referencing the, I think it was a presentation that Trisha Tillotson might've given or someone from her department on the road clearing, uh, the roadside, county roadside tree clearing that was, uh, had funding had been attained for. Uh, Myron says he thinks it got put on hold due to fire risks. I'm not sure about that. He's wondering if the work is ongoing or has it been restarted? And could we possibly get an update or each month, I'm thinking maybe each quarter on the percentage of, the, of, of how that completion is coming along? 
Yeah, and Susan, I can speak to that. Um, again, Paul Cummings from County OES. Um, we work with Public Works to track this. Is actually, it's, a, it's one of the board objectives. The board objective is for wildfire. And so we do monthly reporting to the board. And so that's all um, public facing. So, so folks can go see what those numbers look like for either mowing, um, spraying, or actual you know, limbing, up of, limbing up of trees. Um, public, County Public Works did receive a CAL FIRE grant for around $850,000. I guess it's been about a year ago now that they've started implementing those funds. So they have coupled that with their gas tax funding to reduce the fuel load along key evacuation routes and county roads. Um, I will say that the winter storm brought down a lot of trees. And so they've been um, working to remove the trees that were you know, either across roads or that had been pushed off to the sides that were immediate hazards. So that may have shifted that a little bit, but I did put in the chat, I, I think for Myron, um, the Ready Nevada County dashboard actually has a tab that residents can go click on that'll show when work was done or when it's scheduled to be done on county roads in our community. So I, I would encourage folks to go look at that to get information on when the county roads near their home will be cleared. Thank you, Paul. And it, Myron apparently actually did go look at the map during the meeting and he came back to say that it has a lot of roads color coded as scheduled for 2021 He's suggesting maybe the map and the plan needs to be updated on the dashboard. Do you know if any public roads have been finished in 2022 is his question. Yeah, and I realized that, the, that there's some outdated information on there. We're actually working on that internally. We've identified that. So um, they just, with because the, they use a spreadsheet that they feed it with. And so they just need to, to fix that. So um, we've identified that. Stand by, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, you'll be able to see that current information. But they're Thank actively you. working on the roads right now. Great. Thank you. Lewis is asking, and this would be one for Jim or perhaps Roger, how effective are fire resistant covers for firewood piles? And he's probably referring to the tarps that are sold as being the fire resistant tarps. You, you, you don't want to just put a regular old plastic tarp from B and C on a fire pile. That's not going to uh, fire wood pile. That won't do anything. But the fire resistant covers, Lewis is wondering how effective they really are to cover your wood pile. Uh, Susan, I'll take it. I, I don't really know. I haven't. I haven't actually seen any in action. So, uh, what I do know is that embers that land in your wood pile have a tendency to catch that dry wood on fire. So, anything that would keep an ember out of it, if it was like a, a you know a thick metal reflective type of material uh that that kept a lot of those uh, embers out i think that they'd be more successful than not having one i think the priority is to have the wood pile at least 30 feet but as far as possible away from your home uh and so if you put something over it to maintain that wood pile because nobody wants to lose all their wood storage right before winter because the fires seem to happen just right before it turns into december it is where it gets cold uh I, I don't know. I haven't actually seen any in action, so I don't know the effectiveness of them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandra mentions a part of the discussion, I think it was from Roger's presentation on the self-sealing vents. She mentions that they can be a problem with bees filling them with mud for their nests. So I, we hadn't heard that one before here at the coalition. So uh, that's an interesting thing. Here's a question from Adrian. Uh, well, Carrie's asked to be reminded of the resource for the spec and the, di the diagram for the storage hookup. We will have that document on the coalition website, probably not in the next week and a half because I'm going on vacation. Maybe I, we can get Jeff to put it up. But once we get these documents up on the coalition website, we will uh, notify that in the next email that goes out. Adrian's asking, how do you make sure your water storage container hasn't lost water? due to evaporation or whatever, and, and know if the water is clean or not. Jim answered, I I, actually I, here, yeah, I just, I'm sorry, yeah. I just saw Jim's answer in the chat. Make sure it's connected to a reliable water supply. Make sure there's a float valve that you, where you can read the results of the float valve and see if it's high or low, I suppose, and monitor that, that information frequently. Anything else you wanted to add there, Jim? That, that's pretty much it. You know, there, there should be an automatic valve that when the water gets, you know, evaporates down to a certain level and uh, it, it refills that tank. 
you know, inspecting it once a month wouldn't hurt at all. You can take a look at it. Uh, I can't remember the lady's name that did the presentation, but I, I would say that's a really excellent water supply system. It's really easy to check. There's some easily, you know, you can easily access it right off of the road. So if you were going to put one in, I would follow her example. It looks really good. Okay. And our last question here is from Donna. How does Cal Fire know if your property has a pond or has a driveway that goes from one end of the property so that no turnaround is required? Is there a way that you know that other than just showing up and then you find out? Well, a lot of my folks and a lot of our local government cooperators kind of live in this area and we've responded to calls here for a long time. So certainly we don't know everything. There isn't a database of available water sources or anything like that, just because it, it's garbage in, garbage out. Sometimes they're maintained and sometimes they aren't. So you, you can have a water system that somebody put in and then three years later, it, it sprung a leak and they just never bothered to fix it. So it's not reliable for us to enter that data in. Most of us know where the, the lakes and ponds and NID ditches are, and that's what we will reliably use. We almost always bring water tenders with us to these fires. So that's that's our reliable water source. And as far as driveways that you know have thoroughfares or, or big turnarounds in them, we just don't, there's, there's no way to keep that kind of a database. I mean, we have a lot of local people that know the area. We do have our computers and our rigs that have some information, but that's really only as good as the map layers of, uh, of like Google Earth or Google Maps with the satellite pictures. So we can see that, but we do have uh, our air attack platform on a major wildland fire that's, that's flying over the top and they can direct the resources towards other water supplies if we can't locate them readily, or they can give us cautions about roadways that look like they're pretty narrow. So I, I hope that helps with the answer. Sure, and, and Lauren, who gave us the water tank presentation that she and her husband did, she reminded me that, uh, and this is for the person about the specs, the specs are on our coalition website and on the sidebar, you look under my fire department. So if you don't know where your fire department is, you can find that there, but also there is a sheet with a link with, called the official standard number 102 that has the specs for uh, water tanks. Thank you, Lauren. And yeah, the Scott, one that, that I sent you, Susan, is yeah. it's a little bit hard to see or hard to find on the Nevada County website. So that's why I sent it to you to hopefully get on there. But if you live in Nevada County Consolidated District, they really have a good handout. And you can call them and they'll email it to you that day. They're, they're really efficient at that. Okay. And we'll get yours up there too, Jim. So Scott, that that's it. All right. Who else has a question? Anyone want to unmute and ask live? 